Hello and welcome to our live broadcast. Hope is not canceled. Caregivers bring suicide out of the darkness. I'm Erin Wasim. I have a medical disclaimer to share before we get started. Just a reminder that the information provided today is for informational and educational purposes. So if you have any medical questions, please reach out to a healthcare professional. I also want to share a content warning. Um, our conversation today is going to cover some real world issues, including depression, mental health, and suicide. So if you are struggling, this program may not be right for you right now. Uh, you may want to watch it at a later time. So if you need someone to talk to, there's always help available. Uh, you can reach out to the crisis text line by texting TALK to 741741, or you can call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK to talk to someone who can help. With that, we're going to get started and meet our guests. So joining me today are these uh, three wonderful women who are involved in the Out of the Darkness Walks. And I first want to invite Valerie to introduce herself. Hello, my name is Valerie Kavakovich. I am the Senior Director of the Western Division of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And in my work, I have the opportunity and privilege to work with volunteers, participants, chapters in 12 states. Thank you, Valerie. And how about Kathy? Would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kathy Welch. I am a team captain for Providence um, in Torrance. I've um, been a nurse at Providence for over 23 years. I work in the intensive care unit there. And I am very um, honored and privileged to be a part of this uh, live Facebook Live today. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And finally, Renee, would you please like to introduce yourself? Sure. I am Renee Serwinski. I am a licensed mental health counselor over at Pacific Medical Centers um, at our Kirkland location. And I've been here about four years. I've been practicing um, doing therapy in that for over 20. Thank you. Just a little bit of experience, right? <laughs> just a little. Just a little. <laughs> yeah. So we have um, Renee and myself are from the sort of Seattle, Washington area. And then we've got Valerie and Kathy calling us from uh, the Bay Area and Southern California. So uh, we're representing the West Coast here today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what we're going to talk about today. Um, Providence has sponsored the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's Out of the Darkness Walks since 2016. Uh, the organization made a commitment to improve mental health system-wide, and this is one of the ways in which we're doing that. So the first year, we had hundreds of caregivers join our Out of the Darkness Walks, and we raised over $42,000 for suicide prevention in our communities. So it an amazing accomplishment. Kudos to everybody on this call and everybody who supports our Out of the Darkness Walks work. Um, Providence uh, understands that the stress of the pandemic is really impacting our mental health and it's having an impact on the mental health of our communities. So uh, we want our communities to know they're not alone and that they're never alone when dealing with suicide and mental illness. And that's one of the reasons that we, uh, we go out and we engage in the Out of the Darkness Walks. Um, but the Out of the Darkness walks look a little different this year um, as we are facing a pandemic. And I'm going to invite Valerie to tell us a little bit more about who AFSP is, uh, what the Out of the Darkness walks are, and what they look like this year in 2020. Well, thanks, Erin. And first, I would like to thank Providence for all the support that you've given us throughout the years in supporting our walks. Um, so our Out of the Darkness community walks traditionally every year is a time when 300,000 people across the country gather in over 400 cities. And this year they're gonna look a little different um, because of the pandemic and all of the uh, criteria as far as gathering um, in large, uh, uh, gathering in large communities. We can't do that this year, so we've pivoted and we are calling our walks the out of the darkness experiences. Um, but that doesn't mean that our mission has changed. Our mission is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. So we can still find opportunities to connect at, through our experiences. Um, and you're still supporting AFSP and suicide prevention when you participate in our experiences this year. And traditionally our walks bring together all supporters of suicide prevention, but mostly those who have lost loved ones to suicide and those who may be struggling and those who obviously also support the cause. But our walks have always been an opportunity to provide hope and healing and a place of comfort to know that you're not alone. 
So this year we're encouraging everyone to find an experience in your community, register, and then, um, you know, every experience will have uh, a, a way in which you can participate virtually. So you go and log on to the page or check out their Facebook live feed and see what they're doing for their experience that day. There will be a program for every experience. And then what we're encouraging our participants to do this year is to create your own journey. So what does it mean to you? Focus on your health, uh, focus on your well-being, focus on your self-care, take that time to reflect. So maybe your experience when you participate in this year is to walk, or maybe your experience is to hike, or maybe you're gonna bake, but you're gonna do something for you. So we're just trying to make it creative this year and still support the cause and still reflect on why you're supporting AFSP. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I can share too, for my experience this year, I'm really focusing on getting out and moving every day for my mental health. I know that helps my mental health a lot. So uh, maybe the more I move, the more I can bake. Maybe some cookies are in my future. <laughs> I love it, I think it's great. Like you said, do what you need to do for you, so. Right, and maybe that's what I need to do. Self-care, <laughs> self-care is important. Um, well, I wanted to um, invite Kathy and Renee to tell us a little bit about why they get involved in the walk and, and how they got involved with AFSP. So Kathy, I wanted to start with you first because I know that you have been um, one of our main leaders and champions in getting Southern California caregivers really engaged in this work. So tell us a little bit about why you got involved in the walks. Well, when, um, so my son, David, he died by suicide December 31st, 2017. And I was actually, you know, I was off work um, uh, for a few months after that. And I was at home and I was looking for something, um, trying to make, you know, a purpose out of this grief. And I was looking for something, uh, some way to get involved. And I, you know, Google searches and all, and I came across AFSP. So did a lot of Studying on that, I called, I spoke to our area director at the time, and it just all fell into place. And so I went to a planning meeting, uh, like in February, and it just, and I, and I, after, from there, and I, so I got involved from there. And then from that, I thought, oh my gosh, I need to connect Providence with AFSP. This is huge. Providence would be so great at sponsoring this, and I was so um, pleasantly surprised to find out this, uh, that uh, Providence had before. So it was a wonderful connection and I became, you know, I had my own team, David, and then uh, with AFSP and then became, naturally became a team captain with the Providence teams. So it's, uh, it's been a good relationship and it's been supportive and I've met amazing, amazing people along with my positive. So that's how I got involved. Thank you for sharing that, Kathy. And we are connected virtually in this live broadcast. So there, just to let people know, we might be fading out at times. So there was a few points that I didn't hear you, but I, I heard that message loud and clear that you're walking for David and that you're walking for your coworkers and your colleagues and your family. Um, that's how I got engaged in the walks as I was leading a family team um, in memory of my brother who died by suicide 10 years ago. And when I was also an employee at Providence and got Providence engaged too um, in this work and organized not only a family team, but a, a caregiver team as well, just like you. Um, so I wanted to invite Renee to share how she got involved um, in the Out of the Darkness Walks. Thank you. I was involved in the past when I lived actually in Illinois and I did a walk there once supporting some friends who were struggling some with depression and a lot of suicide attempts. And, and I'm very grateful nobody was successful. And then when I moved out here and started here at um, Pacific Medical Center's Providence, um, was looking for more ways to get involved. And I have two um, adult children now, 22 and 25, who have both suffered from depression um, and have had a lot of suicidal ideations and difficulties. And I realized the importance of, you know, you know, their mental health that needs to be taken care of and that there are things that I can pull them in and get them involved with that can help them. And it started with just, you know, making sure that they had some support. Um, and I thought it was a good way to feed them into a community of individuals that they can talk to and not feel so alone. And that was a really great thing actually for, for both of them. 
and it just kind of continues from there. Um, and that, you know, when I think about it with just where we are today, seeing um, all the depression on the rise and the anxieties and stressors that I hear from people and even the stories when they come in and some hopelessness that I hear every once in a while, um, unfortunately more often than not lately, I think it's really important um, that this is something that we truly pay attention to. Um, and I wanna make sure that that message gets out there, community, family, friends, professionally, you know, however we can do it. Mm -hmm. And thank you for representing your community and, and your kids and mm -hmm. being that example for them. You know, as Renee and Kathy both, you know, working in the clinical space, I, I heard you saying why healthcare workers are so um, passionate about this cause and wondered if you wanted to speak a little bit more about that. Maybe Renee, since you were just speaking, why do you think healthcare mm -hmm. workers are so engaged in this? I do think that, you know, before the pandemic started, there was depressions and anxieties that were slightly on the rise due to a lot of other issues that were happening in society. And then when the pandemic came around, um, there has been a lot more um, focus on some depression. And I think that focus has led people to feel more comfortable to talk about um, when they are feeling that they are to that point where suicide becomes an option for them. And I'm hearing from more and more just in medical providers that these are more some um, urgent cases of people that need to get in. It's not just a depression that's kind of been low lying for a while. It's something that is um, getting more serious because of our climate that we're in and fears that people had never had before about not having a job and not knowing when it's going to end and any connections that they have are all virtual now. Um, they can't have any physical touch, any hugs from people that they want to see and and that and the loss of those things have created, I think, another layer of things that we have to kind of pay attention to. Um, and just, you know, overall, the more that I hear from more young people about it even mm -hmm. is kind of mm -hmm. surprising that it, it becomes for them more of an option rather than something that they had never even thought about before. Mm -hmm. Right, and to your point, the isolation we're all experiencing right now can make it really difficult to reach out for help, um, mm -hmm. but speaking up about it and talking about it like we're doing today will hopefully let people know that they're not alone and that they're not as isolated as they may feel. Um, I wonder what are some resources uh, for help, you know, if somebody feels like they wanna reach out to a therapist, like how would they go about mm -hmm. doing that? You, I mean, there are, you have this, you said the suicide kind of hotline that you'd like posted before with a, you could text, you can call in those numbers, um, the 741741 for the um, text line and um, the 800-273-8255 for the phone um, to call for the National Suicide Hotline and they can connect you with local resources, but there are also crisis counselors there that are available mm -hmm. um, depending on local community, um, in King County, there's a crisis line that somebody can call. Snohomish County has one. Um, there's national youth lines that are available. Um, a national youth line to even um, text um, is actually 839-863. And they'll have a crisis counselor talk to you. Um, and then depending on where you're at, local community, look for your community-based kind of crisis or behavioral health centers. Um, your primary care physician is a really good resource to find you some connection. Um, finding nowadays, actually, our insurance companies are posting right on their pages a lot of, we have virtual um, mental health help due to you know COVID and the crisis. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, I started doing virtual health you know, right before all of this started and watching it boom and seeing it so much, I think I want people to realize, you know, you're not, having to leave your house, but you can make some great connections, um, which with everything happening, I think is a big deal. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing those resources too. And for anyone, wherever they're listening, there are national resources um, and those hotlines that you mentioned and even reaching mm -hmm. out to your own doctor or finding therapists. Um, a lot of people are available virtually through telehealth to appointments right now. So there, mm -hmm. there is help out there. Um, mm -hmm. and, and even I on Facebook, where we're doing the Facebook Live, right? I'm sorry. To Oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, even on Facebook, there is a crisis text line 
that is um, specifically made for crises for someone to be able to check in with um, that way and it's yeah. counselors, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And sorry for the Wi-Fi buffering. Okay. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I wanted to invite Kathy too. You know, you're on the front lines in healthcare in this pandemic, and I am, can imagine the stress that nurses are dealing with um, right now. Um, but I wanted to um, invite you to talk about maybe what benefits you see um, for getting in, involved in these walks, especially right now. Well, that's a um, you know, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, working in ICU is a high stress environment on any given day without the pandemic and all that goes with that. Um, but just to, you know, go over the changes, the changes that I've seen and felt since we really started, um, this really started uh, for us in March, has been just a subtle shift uh, to increased awareness on how each other is doing instead of just focusing on the patient. So it's like, you know, we already work in a field that we're burnout, compassion fatigue, stress related illnesses that lead to isolating and self medicating. Uh, those are real fallouts from the work we do. And now we're openly acknowledging it. So, um, you know, considering the current times and why it's so important to get involved and the benefits, it's like, it's a it's a great question that now is during a period of time that none of us have experienced before. I mean, this the mental health challenges that we face, um, unprecedented is a term that is pretty powerful, has a pretty powerful meaning now in 2020. And the benefits of getting involved now is that we will need these resources so much more in the years ahead. Um, you know, the it leads us to the bigger picture that if we don't find effective treatments for mental illnesses, especially depression, that can lead to suicide, we'll be feeling the social, emotional, uh, financial impact uh, from this type of loss more than ever before. Uh, this is a global issue and it crosses all socioeconomic boundaries and anyone can be effective. So as healthcare providers, um, doctors, psychiatrists, healthcare workers, psychologists, we all need to address the mental health challenges that our nation is experiencing and try to bring this reality out of the darkness is what we're, you know, what we're doing now, trying to. Yeah. Yeah, and like you said, as healthcare workers, I mean, this is for us to walk the talk, right? I mean, we're caring for others, we need to care for each other and ourselves too. Um, I yeah, wonder- I'm seeing that a lot. Are you? I wonder what yeah. um, you're doing for your experience this year and what maybe others on your team are doing. So I happen to be working on my on the experience day on the 24th, but I plan on uh, doing a video, you know, doing a little, you know, phone video with several of the caregivers and us and sending that in and just showing, you know, maybe in our break room, we bring food sometimes we, you know, we just uh, support each other. And then um, several people on the team who are off that day are saying that they're going to be doing a variety of activities, hiking, biking, surfing, walking, um, just sitting and reading. I like the baking idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping that maybe they'll go bake and bring them to the unit. <laughs> but uh, there will be a variety of things that people will do. Yes. Baking sounds like a popular choice. <laughs> and as Valerie said earlier, you know, as she mentioned earlier, it's so important to do what's what's good for your soul, what's good for yourself. Absolutely. I mean, Valerie, what else are you hearing um, from other teams? Anything really interesting or unique or different or maybe what's the most popular choice? Is it baking? What are people doing for their experiences? I hope it's baking, too. But um, <laughs> I think a lot of people and I also in some areas where it's safe to connect or in your pod, you know, you have your mm -hmm. social pod that you can be together that, you know, go for a hike, go for a walk on a trail, um, you know, do things like that, uh, that, you know, can have some camaraderie. Also, you don't have to be in the same um, town anymore. You can actually you can actually register for multiple experiences and join teams with your family that maybe lives afar or your friends that live afar as well and try to find some ways to connect while you're doing your experience. Maybe you're sharing photos or you're going to do a Zoom call at the end. 
um, and all gather together. There's a lot of different creative ways that people are are really embracing um, this new this new experience. It is. It's a new world. And <laughs> for everyone, though, know, that's what we say. It's new yeah, for everybody. So. It's new for everybody. And especially in COVID, we're all baking a lot. I'm hearing that. You know, we're all <laughs> making our banana bread and our sourdough. <laughs> so, yeah. Renee, how about you? What are you going to do for your experience? Uh, I'm actually going to walk since um, I was working from home virtually for the couple of months that I was, I started walking more and more every day. And I keep trying to find new areas where I just moved to two years ago in a new home. Um, and that's my goal is to find somewhere new to walk and go that day. And while I'm doing that, make the connection with my family members who I don't get to talk to often mm -hmm. and make that time be really invested in conversation and, and staying in touch and being close with them. Um, because I know that they're feeling some of the same things and they're far away. And since I can't see them visit, this is the perfect way to do it. And show them around my neighborhood since they live in another state. You know, we video it so they get to see all around. I'm like, oh, look at this house. Oh my God, look at these flowers. Look at these <laughs> things. And um, it's, it's, it's a fun way to share it. Yeah, it's a virtual tour and a connection yep. and exercise all rolled into all one. one. All in one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kathy, you know, I had this idea and I'm wondering what you're thinking because the walks were so important for coming together and that remembrance opportunity for the loved ones that we've lost. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about incorporating the remembrance for David into your experience day. Well, since I'll be at work, it'll be a little different, but um, I think I'm gonna wear my white beads to work. And so. Valerie, will you talk, tell us a little bit about the beads? Yes, yeah, so our honor beads are um, various colors that reflect the loss that you have. So um, our participants traditionally will come to our events and, and they'll gather their beads. So blue is to support the cause, white beads means the loss of a child and et cetera. So people will wear their beads at the events. And even if you don't talk to somebody, you just know by looking at their bead color, what their loss may be. And it's, it's a way to still kind of connect without even having to talk to someone if you don't want to, or it's a private mm -hmm. moment for people, but it's also a way to engage. If you see the same color loss, you might want to go and have a conversation with people. So it's really kind of how, how you feel when you're wearing the beads those days and how you want to connect, but it really is a way for us to reflect those losses and your connection to the cause. I have to, yeah, I'm sorry. I just have to say, you know, ex, um, expand on what Valerie just said, because at the walks, um, you had that immediate connection. Like if I saw other people with white beads, we immediately had that connection for the loss of a child. And you could just go up and hug that person and you understood. So, and, and you know, sibling loss, it's just, it's very powerful. So even though we don't, even though we don't um, meet in person this year, we have next year to look forward to. And we will, you know, AFSP has not been silent. Providence's support of AFSP has continued. So we've gotten through, I'm so proud of our organization and AFSP and how we've adapted to these times. So thank you so much. Yeah, and Kathy, I love that idea of wearing beads to work. I'm going to wear my beads on walk day as well, just in solidarity with you. And that'll Thank be you. a good one too. In my virtual Zoom meetings, people can ask about it. And it's an opportunity to share with them what it means and why it's important. And we all wear blue beads, right? Because blue supports the cause. Mm -hmm. And um, anybody can wear blue beads on, on any day, really. Mm -hmm. um, but we are getting close to our time to wrap. So before I have one last question for everyone, but before I get there, was there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to cover? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Um, I think that there are myths out there that people feel that if they talk to That's somebody about it. Okay. You go ahead. Keep so going. I, it's, it's, um, you know, personal experience with this and also the fact that wishing, you know, when you have a, a loss that's so tragic, you wish you go back and you always wish you had done something. And um, I do remember talking to David about, uh, about, you know, depression and all. And, and we worked together very closely trying to find him help. He was really, um, 
he was very um, passionate about getting help for himself. So my my takeaway and my advice to people is that don't ever feel like you're going to make someone think about suicide because they've already thought about it. So please don't ever be shy to approach somebody that you care for and that you're concerned about and that you just might have a gut instinct that they're, you know, that they're in that dark place. Um, what you don't know that you might be doing is that you might be saving a life. You might be giving them that little bit of something that they need, just that little bit of love or caring that they need to bring them out of that state at that time. So you're never going to make anybody think about dying by suicide or taking their life. They've already thought about it. They may even have a plan. So approach. It's okay. Right. Thank you so much for saying that. I uh, it's an, such a big myth that we need to bust. And in our closing, I wanted to invite you all to share, you know, that that myth out there that just really bugs you or gets under your skin that you want to take an opportunity to educate people on. So, Valerie, how about you next? What's what's a myth you about suicide or mental health you want to bust in, in your kind of closing comments? Well, honestly, I have to agree with everything that Kathy said. That's the exact same thing that I would say as well, is that we need to be able to talk about suicide. And if you're concerned with someone, you need to have those conversations with them. And if in that moment in time, they're not, it's it, that's okay too. You're not gonna put that idea into their head. And you're also going to show them that you are a safe person, that you they can come to you if they need help. Um, so I just think whenever we're concerned, we need to ask those questions. Are you thinking about suicide and not, and not be a, a, a afraid? We need to be able to just have those honest conversations. So, Right. Fear fear is often uh, braver, bravery in disguise. And that's courage that it takes to ask somebody if they're thinking about suicide. And that could be what saves life. So, Renee, how about you? What's what's your myth and your, your kind of closing takeaway? You know, I, honestly, it is the same thing is, is, you know, making sure you're using the words and not to be afraid even yourself to ask the question and that they're going to be mad at you or upset with you because they'll get over that, but they'll be here to get over that rather than trying to ignore it and convince yourself that that's not, that's not what's happening. They're, they're going to be okay. Um, mm -hmm. Is they're the right words, not, not just, are you going to hurt yourself, but are you thinking of committing suicide? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Do you have a plan? You know, what can I do to support you? Can we make some sort of safety planning even like who you can call or um, what you can do if you're feeling really down and giving them that those things to know like there are people there that care. Mm -hmm. Because so many people get in that spot of they can't see that anybody else is around to care. It's that there's nobody available. And I even remind, you know, individuals when I work with them, I'm like, I may have a moment where I feel like there's nobody I can call because I'm going through something. And my husband joked with me once and he picked up my phone. He's like, you have three to 600 connections in your phone. There's <laughs> nobody you can call on here. And it's a reminder of there's nobody I felt I could call at that moment. Right. And creating like a plan and putting in there. And I joke and I'm like, but I have, you know, created like groups of like, call this person if depressed, call this person if it's the middle of the night you know, whatever. I'm like, and those are individuals that I know I've talked to and said, if I need you, can you be there? Um, and knowing that I, it's reaching out. So. Yeah, that's such a practical tip and a really important mm -hmm. takeaway of how we can prepare ourselves, uh, you know, if we are feeling isolated and down, how mm -hmm. we can reach out. So thank you all for sharing that. You're I welcome. You know, would just agree with all of you and even add to that conversation to just trust your gut. If somebody seems off and they don't seem like they're themselves, you don't have to have any sort of a special certification or you don't have to be yeah. a doctor. You don't have to be, you know, an expert to follow up with them and ask them if they're thinking about suicide. And your job is not to save their life. Your job is to connect them to the lifesavers, to those experts. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would just encourage you to, you know, of course, learn more about it. There are a lot of, uh, uh, takeaways like Renee was talking about making a plan and ways that you can connect people. There's a lot of information out there and AFSP is a great place to start where you can learn that information. Uh, but yeah, trust yourself, trust your gut, trust the people that you love. And if they're giving you some warning signs, follow up on those. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So thank you, everybody, for your engagement in the walks and for uh, joining the conversation today. I hope that your experience days are amazing and that you remember your loved ones and that you uh, take care of yourself. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, 
thank everybody for listening. Um, and to learn more about the Out of the Darkness walks, you can go to outofthedarkness.org. If you need assistance, please reach out to the resources in your community. A great starting place is providence.org. We can connect you to community resources. Um, and make sure to follow us on social media as well. And we'll be sharing great information there also. So thank you all for joining and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>